God compares a marriage relationship with a relationship of him and his people. It's spelled out in the book of Hosea. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we go from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We've been doing that for 31 years. This is our 31st year. It is a good day to read the Bible. Corey is here with Ryan. Corey, what's up? Well, I'm going to be taking a look at a king of Israel that is specifically mentioned by the prophet Hosea. Ryan, how about you? Well, today and tomorrow, you and I are going to take a survey of the 12 minor prophets. Just who were they and when did they minister? All right, very good. Look forward to that. And Janice, what did you do on this day? Well, today it's called All or Nothing. All or Nothing, that's mm -hmm. it. Okay, so you have your Bible, hopefully. That's the most important book of all. Get your Bible guide out. If you don't have a Bible guide, why not? I'll tell you how to get one later. It's important to begin to read through the book of Hosea. We are going to look at Hosea chapter 3. Let's open it up. Hosea 3, verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half omers of barley. And I said to her, You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Today we continue with the book of Hosea, chapters 1 through 4 as we read through the Bible in one year. This is very exciting. Now we're gonna isolate several verses in chapter three that have to deal with this subject, a message through marriage. Very interesting. Now Hosea is somebody who lives this and it gets very, very interesting. His name in Hebrew actually means salvation. Hosea's life did indeed represent God's salvation. He was a prophet of God during the time just before Northern Israel fell to Assyria. Just as God was dealing with people who had blatantly broken covenant with him, so Hosea married a prostitute at the instruction of God who would not keep the marriage covenant. The first two chapters of the book of Hosea are rich with conflict and meaning. Now, God was illustrating the reality of Israel's idolatry and foolishness. Just like his God, Hosea experienced turmoil and pain in his marriage. Now, we aren't told how it ended for Hosea, but we do know that through him, God effectively articulated his disappointment in Israel, identified the problem, and offered solutions in Hosea chapter 3. And Hosea chapter 3 is only five verses, but they are powerful. They are meaningful. Now, take your Bible guide and turn to this particular passage today. It is very, very good on this 30th day of August. Keep that in mind. And as we focus on it, uh, remember, you can write to us or call us or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on the Bible guide there. It'll take you to a page for donate. Let me just say thank you so much for your donations. I very much appreciate them. They keep us alive here. And uh, they've, been, they've been good over the past few weeks. And man, we thank you so much for paying attention to that. But then after you're done there, it'll take you to a page where you can download the Bible guide and really look at the Bible guide just as we do. You'll notice there's more material there than we're able to teach. And the reason for that is because of time. But today, a message through marriage. Father, help us as we dive into this. 
and we look at it and see this short five-verse chapter as we begin to understand what you're saying and what you're doing. And then I pray, Lord, that we would hear from you as the scripture says, then the Lord said, or as the Lord said, help us to hear from you, Lord, and apply this today in the way that you mean it, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we say these things in Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we look at the scripture, notice, first of all, that then the Lord said to me, then the Lord said to me, God is talking to Hosea, beloved, and he is the one who told Hosea to marry this woman. Anyway, he says, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel. And that's the meaning of his prophecy, really, who looked to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. Notice here that God speaks very specifically to Israel. God compares his love and relationship with Israel to Hosea's marriage with, prostit with a prostitute, Gomer. God desires a relationship, beloved, a relationship of the heart, not a religion. A lot of people tell me, well, I'm not a religious man and I'm not a religious woman when I'm talking to them about the Lord. And I always say, that's great. I'm not either. <laughs> and they're confused. What do you mean? You're a pastor, right? I'm not religious. Beloved, religion is, God's, is man's way to find God. Relationship is God's way to discover man and for man to discover God. Very, very important to remember that. As we move on, we learn some more about this from Hosea chapter 3, verse 2. So I bought, brought her rather or bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one and a half homers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So two, I will be towards you. In other words, I'll marry you. Now this is fascinating. You see, beloved, God gives specific commands to us in order to serve him. God gives specific commands in us or to us in order to serve him. In relationship, we should know how to serve God without laws. A lot of people are wrapped up in the law of God, but let me explain something. The law of God is not here so that we can love God better. That's not why it's here. The law of God is primarily something to turn our attention to what we've done wrong. That's what the Ten Commandments are about. When we come to Jesus Christ and when we say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be the Lord of my life, we want to change. We want to change. We don't look to the book to see the laws we have to follow. We want to change. And in changing, because God has given us eternal life, we learn much. Beloved, let's remember that. This is very important, especially today. Now, let's go to this particular passage, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillars, without the ephod and the teraphim. Afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God. They will seek the Lord, their God, the person of God, and David, their king. They shall fear the Lord. They shall pay attention to the Lord and fear him and his goodness in their latter days. And so, beloved, this is God speaking to us. And God says something interesting. God says we will fear the Lord and his goodness in the last days. Today is the time to seek the Lord. We should tell others about him. Now, listen to me carefully. When I talk about fear God, a lot of people are saying, well, I thought God was not about fear. He's not. It's not the kind of fear that we in English so easily say fear. It's the respect of God. It's the knowledge of who he is. The looking at him as holy. That's what we will do. There's a lot of people who say today, well, no one's perfect. There was one. 
Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, beloved. And as we know God, and as we get to know him, he slowly but surely, because we desire to, he changes us for the better. And we begin to do good things and we begin to change our ways. And we're not always demanding my way, my way, my way. We say, okay, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Because that's important. Suddenly our feelings are shifted to the back. When we say to the Lord, come into my life and be the Lord of my life, forgive me of my sin because you paid the cost of sin. And in Jesus' name, I take you as Lord of my life. If we pray that today, if we say that to God, just talk to God and say that. And if you really say that and mean it, then the Lord will come into your life. The Holy Spirit will descend on you. Everything will change and you'll begin a wonderful journey as we begin to go for the Lord and the Lord will make sure you have a place in heaven with him. Our life is renewed by Jesus Christ. We're renewed by him. You see, we live differently than we did before. Before we met. Who? Before we met Jesus Christ. That's who. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And since we're starting the Minor Prophets of the Bible, today I thought it would be really helpful to put these 12 men into perspective and to summarize their lives and careers. Who were they? When did they live? To whom did they prophesy? Well, answering these questions will help put their books and lives into context. Now, because of time constraints, we're going to have to split the study up over two days. So today we're going to be looking at Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and Jonah. So open your Bibles to the book of Hosea, and we're going to go through each prophet book by book. Although the last 12 books of the Old Testament are attributed to men we call the minor prophets, this has nothing to do with the importance of their works, but rather to the length of their ministry, as well as to the length of their books. In fact, their message is essentially identical to that of the major prophets, which is to depart from evil and turn wholeheartedly to God. In a nutshell, to love God and to love neighbor. It is indeed the law and the prophets, just as Jesus said. And nothing about these so-called minor prophets suggests a minor message. On the contrary, they warned in often dramatic fashion that destruction would come if the recipients of that prophecy failed to repent. Hosea, the first of the Bible's minor prophets, made this exceedingly clear to the northern kingdom of Israel. In fact, in order to illustrate God's relationship with unfaithful Israel, Hosea was commanded to marry a woman of harlotry. He prophesied in the 8th century BC during the reign of King Jeroboam II, which places his prophecies just shortly before the nation fell to Assyria in 722 BC. Even though God was offering Israel salvation, which is what the name Hosea means, they refused. After Hosea comes Joel, or at least when it comes to the ordering of their books. In truth, the date of his prophecies are unknown, though many scholars believe them to be sometime around 830 BC. If so, then this would make him the earliest writing prophet. Just as Hosea was called to warn the northern kingdom of Israel of impending destruction, Joel was called to warn the southern kingdom of Judah of the same. In fact, he used the current natural disasters of the locust invasion and drought to illustrate a coming military invasion of Judah. Then there was Amos. Though he was not a professional prophet at all, but rather a shepherd and grower of sycamore figs, his message was equally divine. Known as God's angry man, Amos came against the oppression of the poor that was all too prevalent in the northern kingdom during the reign of Jeroboam II. As a farmer, Amos would have been particularly sympathetic to the common people and the poor. Following Amos is Obadiah, though it's not really known when he prophesied. Thus, dates for his ministry range anywhere from 850 to 400 BC. What is clear is that he was called to prophesy not against Israel, but against Edom. Due to their continual mistreatment of the Israelites, God was about to bring judgment upon the Edomites. Another prophet called to prophesy against a foreign nation was Jonah. Though he is best remembered for prophesying against Nineveh, he did make other prophecies during the reign of Jeroboam II, not recorded in his book. 
Interestingly, Jonah was from a small Galilean village called Gath Hefer, which means that the Pharisees were wrong when they said that no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. So as I said before, because of time constraints here on television, I had to end with Jonah for today. But tomorrow we'll carry on and conclude our study as we finish off with Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. You know, what's interesting about Jonah, and, and this is a prophet that I really appreciate and I love, but at the same time, he is so bitter towards the Assyrians. He really is. We, we, we don't know how it ended, but he was just sulking. I know. I love the interchanges between Jonah and God. It's just, you know, I, and I love it how it ends. God just ends the book on a question, you know, and I, I just love it. I love it. And, the, you know, the, I mean, you don't know what happens to Jonah. Uh, no. You know, we, we just don't know. But again, it's, it's as if God is arguing in the midst of this argument, uh, you know, the entire city of Nineveh has a revival, unbelievable revival, yeah. actually. And, uh, and, 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 but Jonah's still up there. And he's ticked off because God forgave the people. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love the whole thing with, you know, God gives him a bush with shade and everything, and then the bush dies. And I just I just love that, yeah. the, the whole lesson there. That, that, that's a great lesson, Ryan. Corey? Okay, so today we are beginning the Old Testament book of Hosea. So we're going to be taking a look at, you know, um, one of the reigns of a king that Hosea mentions. So right off the bat in Hosea 1, he lets us know that he's prophesying during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Now, if you've been paying close attention, we have heard this exact same list before in Isaiah chapter 1. So this lets us know that Hosea and Isaiah are contemporary prophets. They're, they're ministering at the same time. But Hosea makes an interesting addition. He specifically mentions King Jeroboam of, of Northern Israel. Now, given the kings list that he's already given us, he would have ministered through several kings of Northern Israel, but he specifically only mentions Jeroboam here, which history, mem history remembers as Jeroboam too. So let's take a look at his reign. There were two ancient kings of Israel named Jeroboam. Jeroboam I was the first king of Israel to rule after the nation split. He was not of the Davidic bloodline and became notorious for founding a system of apostate worship, setting up sanctuaries and idols in two key Israelite cities. Jeroboam II came several generations later. He was the great-grandson of usurper King Jehu, responsible for overthrowing Ahab and Jezebel. However, Jeroboam II did not live under his grandfather's shadow. He established his own claim to fame, and one that did not greatly impress the writers of the Bible, whose focus seems quite different than the everyday man. To the eyes of his subjects, Jeroboam II would have been a magnificent, powerful ruler. Even the writers of the Bible record his material accomplishments. He led military campaigns to take back Israelite territory that had been lost to neighboring nations, restoring the border of Israel to a bit beyond what David had established and just under what Solomon had accomplished. This feat of power was apparently prophesied beforehand by the prophet Jonah. Jeroboam II is also described as having great power to wage war and as having brought back a time of prosperity to northern Israel. Yet it was during his long reign of 42 years that the prophets Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah were ministering. They spoke in different places, and yet their messages agreed against the kingdom of northern Israel. Everything looked great from a human perspective, but the king and his people were content to follow the apostasy set up by that first Jeroboam, idol worship. Cultural, social, economic, whatever reasons you want to give to explain idol worship, the fact remains that it was this very thing that the prophet spoke against and called for repentance from. And that is what the biblical author of Kings focused on. Not all of Jeroboam II's great accomplishments, but his failure to acknowledge the God that would have established him. Jeroboam's deviance overshadowed any human accomplishment and indeed made them worthless. I find it really interesting that, uh, you know, during the reign of King Jeroboam II, that, that section of scripture that's talking about his kingship, it also mentions the prophet Jonah. So we've got quite a few prominent prophets of God all existing in this time period. And that actually makes a lot of sense because uh, there's 
quite a bit of history that's going on. I mean, God's judgment to northern Israel and southern Judah is happening during these time periods. So it makes sense that God would surround, you know, his people with true prophets of God to counterbalance those false prophets that we also know were popping up. But I think it's remember that that uh, the prophets of God are not perfect people either. Oh no, not at all. And you know, when you when you look at this, you begin to understand that and you say, "Wait a minute." This guy wasn't nice, like Jonah, for example. That guy wasn't nice. That, but God still uses. Them. Yeah, no, a gift of God is not a marker. Uh, it's not. It's not. You know, an endorsement of all of your personality traits, or uh, you know, even all of your actions. That's not what it is. It's just people responding to the true message of God and staying faithful to it. So there is a difference between you know, you know, following God's call on your life and God endorsing everything you've ever done. That's just not the same. Thing. Because, you know, we're not, you know, they're not Jesus Christ. No. And that, that becomes very important. That's fascinating, Corey. Thank you for that study, mm -hmm. Janice. Well, in, in following that uh, line of thinking, you know, as we read through, especially the prophets, and we see a lot of uh, the things that God has asked them to do, there's a lot of disturbing things that we're reading within the pages of the Bible that, mm -hmm. that culturally where we are right now, we have no understanding, which is why, you know, so many of us appreciate your segments, Corey, on biblical culture and biblical history that can set our minds right, mm -hmm. not trying to compare ourselves in that culture. But as we get to Hosea, you know, it, it, it is this disturbing thought that God is asking Hosea to marry a woman who uh, her, her livelihood is a prostitute. And we begin to read down here, but I, I kind of want to take it into a little bit of a different spin. Um, so God has told Hosea to marry a woman who has lovers, and it's going to be a demonstration of, of what Israel has done to, to God. But when we get to verse two, it says, so I bought her, this is Hosea talking. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half homers of barley. And I said to her, and he, the, here are his instructions to Homer, who will be his wife. You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. And then it says, so too, will I be toward you? So this was a two-way commitment, a two-way covenant between them, asking her to do something that she wasn't normally to do. And he was paying a price for her. And it really reminded me of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in that when we make a covenant with him, he paid a ransom for us with his shed blood on the cross that bought our freedom and gave us a gift of eternal life if we are to receive him, if we are to say, yes, God, I repent of my sins. I can't do life alone. I need to come back to you, God. And, and, and this is what Christ has done for us. But in that, God has separated himself. He loves us so much that he has made that commitment to us that he is the way, he is the truth. He is the life. And when we come to him, we need to, to remember that commitment, that that was something that none of us could pay. Uh, in this time with Homer and, and, and Hosea, she needed to be committed to him. And that was something that she had to make that commitment for, knowing, going into it. And so I just it's just a reminder for us today that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul and with all of our strength. He needs to be our number one love, our number one focus, if we are to follow him the way we have committed our lives to do that. And that, that's, that's very important because to be our number one focus in a world with social media and everything else going on, um, that means there are so many distractions out there mm -hmm. and, and we're worried about the internet, is it safe and all that other business going on. And we turn on the radio and we hear commercials flying at us and we see commercials on television flying at us. Hey, internet is going crazy with commercials. What does that mean to make God number one? It means every day we settle down and we say, okay, for the next half hour or the next 20 minutes, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to just settle down. I'm going to listen to God. And that becomes important. Well, there's a lot of things out there that can distract us away from God even things like with Homer, that was her livelihood. 
That was how she made her life. That was the norm for her. And so I'm sure because of the reputation that she would have had, she would have had very many offers and opportunities to do some things on the side, to maybe compromise just a little bit, because if I can do, just do this for a little bit, that, that won't hurt that, right? And we think, oh, well, that would be terrible. But you know, we do it too. We compromise in our faith. We compromise in the word. We say, well, that doesn't really mean that, does it? Or I can do that because God's got to love me, right? And that's not what God calls us to. God calls us to a place. And you know what? We can't do it on our own. Being a Christian doesn't mean, if I'm a Christian, that means I'm perfect. Absolutely not. It means that I have to, I have to spend time with him every day. I have to know what his word says, get it in my heart so that when I go to respond to something the way Janice would normally respond to that, I have to go, wait a minute, oh, right? I've, I've committed my life to Christ and this is what I need to do. So we need to make sure that that the things in this world, the things in this culture don't distract us from the word of God. And sometimes that can even be within our own Christian communities where we're paying more attention to the cultural things uh, than we are to the biblical things. You hit it right on the head, man. I'll tell you, right. There's a lot of people going, uh, okay. And yeah. we all need to take stock. We all need to take a look at our own selves, not be pointing our fingers at other people, but to ourself. Look inward first. I can't think of a better way to end the program than through prayer. And uh, this is really the way we need to pray today. As we've read the Bible, we need to pray and say, Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Thank you for your salvation for my soul. Thank you, Father, for your salvation for everybody who calls on you. Now, Lord, as I pray this, I want to ask, help me to follow you. <laughs> help me to follow in faithfulness and to turn away from sin to show your grace and righteousness in my life.